on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome back to this program. Well, I, maybe maybe the first guest ever. I think we, he may have been the very first guest before before even I started in radio. He was the first guest. Like literally, he was in our practice session uh, from the uh, the Uber blog, uh, Daily Co's. Marcos Melitzis, welcome to the program, Marcos. Uh, always a pleasure, Sam. Always a pleasure. And it's been what eight years? It has been uh, eight plus years now. Eight years, eight. seven months. Crazy. Crazy. And five days, just off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> so okay, so give us a sense of. Let's start uh, with the. Uh, basically, what I want to do is I want to start with what your sense is. Uh, what we should be looking for in the presidential election? What's going to What's going to happen? Who's going to win? By how much? As I race to trade sports to cash in on this, uh, and then we'll look at some of the uh, the state races, and then we'll talk about how much we anticipate the right wing uh, freaking out tomorrow, uh, or I should say Wednesday. What? Uh, so so give us your sense. What, where is this presidential election going to come down to? It's. I mean. The- to me, as far as I was concerned, this race has been over in August, and that's when Obama had massive leads in uh, in all the key states that mattered. And uh, I actually had factored in the possibility of a disaster happening that would knock Obama down, and it, and it did. It was that first debate. But fact is that Obama never has has trailed in this in this race, and and nothing in the last couple of days has has indicated that there's any sort of momentum. In fact, any momentum Romney had after that first debate has really been gone for the last two weeks, no matter what they've said. And it's one of the things that that uh, Republicans used to say they took for granted was that the independent, that undecided voters would break for Mitt Romney. Actually, we're seeing the opposite. We're seeing undecided voters now break for Obama. And even in the most recent polling among undecided voters, they like Obama more. So Obama has more upside with those voters. So it's it's going to be. It's I don't particularly think that there's going to be a lot of suspense in the presidential election. I think uh, early in the night, if Virginia gets called uh, for Obama within the first couple hours, I think that's it. I think Ohio will really clinch it, though. I'm not seeing a lot of um, a lot of drama in Ohio right now. So okay, so we're looking at the um, uh, from an electoral standpoint. It's Virginia and Ohio, <clears throat> and does President Obama need New Hampshire? I mean, tell us what your what your map looks like. So if people wanted to uh, are following this thing tomorrow. I mean, I I imagine you do too. But I attract um, a just a tremendous amount of anxiety uh, of people coming. I mean, I I I can show you some of the emails I get. People just going like, "You're insane! I, how, th- there's no way that uh, Obama's going to win tomorrow, and I want him to, you know, on and on, what, uh, to to alleviate their anxiety. So they should be watching for Virginia. How does that? What wh- what is the recipe there? We've got uh, Kerry states in 2004 plus what? Um, basically, I mean, New Hampshire actually is kind of an odd little duck. I mean, for New Hampshire to be relevant, there has to be a lot of crazy states falling this way and that ain't going to happen. Um, so New Hampshire is actually not going to really decide this election. So wherever New Hampshire goes, I wouldn't sweat it. Uh, I think it's going to go Obama, but not very relevant state. The first batch of states that are going to be, that are going to come in poll closing wise are going to be Virginia, North Carolina, Florida. All three of them are likely to be too close to call. So they're going to sit. I, I see Florida right now. Obama is uh, a smidgen ahead in the poll composites. Now, when I talk about polling, I talk about the composites. I don't choose and pick which poll I like. I take them all. I average them out. Um, right now, Florida is basically tied. Now, given the voting shenanigans in South Florida where, where voters were turned away from early voting over the weekend, uh, that could be enough to turn that election against us. So I would have been fairly optimistic, except that our people aren't being allowed to vote. So, But Florida, again... Um, I mean, Florida gets called for Obama again. It's over. There's no way Romney can win without Florida. Uh, if Virginia gets called for Obama again, there's no way Romney can win without Virginia. But let's say worst case scenario, Virginia, North Carolina, Florida go for Romney. Then you have a let me a little handy dandy little calculator here, electoral math. You have Romney at 248 electoral votes. He still needs. Even Ohio gets into 266. Again, Ohio is not going to go Romney. I mean, the polling's showing anywhere between a three and five point lead right now for, for Obama. 
And again, it's one of those states where the numbers are trending Obama's direction, not the other way around. So I'm not going to see, I'm not seeing much drama. Um, they're not going to call it. I don't think the networks are going to call it early just because it's not going to look good. You're going to want to wait a while. But after that, though, you're looking at Michigan. Uh, Pennsylvania supposedly is competitive. It's not competitive. They'll get called early. Uh, Wisconsin, Iowa, Colorado, and Nevada, the final batch of states. Nevada, Iowa, Wisconsin are looking solidly in, Obama, in Obama's hands. So let's say worst case scenario, Ohio falls to Obama, I mean to Romney. He's at 266. He needs to pick up one of those other states. The most likely would be Colorado because that's the one that sort of looks pretty tied down. Again, undecided seem to be breaking Obama's direction, but that's going to be a close state. Republicans have done very well in the early voting. So I, I would say that that's one of the more likely states to turn red to cycle. But again, it's, it's the, the, you know, Romney would have to really, really run the map. And if we're looking at the polling right now and looking at uh, sort of early voting and whatnot, Obama's going to win Virginia. Florida is a 50-50. North Carolina probably will go Romney, although we've been absolutely kicking it, killing it in the early voting. And, uh, and beyond that, Wisconsin looks solidly, uh, safely Obama. Iowa looks safely Obama. Nevada looks safely Obama. So it's, it's a map that uh, isn't going to be as gaudy as it was in 2008, but still Obama, they, Obama's team, they knew the states they needed to win. They've invested in them. They made sure they were locked down. Even after that first debate, when his national numbers fell, Obama held steady in the battlegrounds. And now we're heading into Election Day with a great deal of moment, momentum, real momentum, not fake momentum, but momentum you can actually see in the data at Obama's back. All right, so there you have it, folks. Um, now you can uh, now you know uh, uh, how how to follow this. You don't need to freak out until um, it, it, unless I guess uh, Ohio. That's when people should get nervous. If uh, for some reason that Ohio heads to Romney, this is presuming, of course, that people uh, that uh, and I don't want to offend all of the thousands of Romney voters who I know listen to this program, uh, but. <laughs> But um, now, so give us a sense of, of, of the Senate. This is, you know, two years ago, everybody was talking about, and I certainly was one of those people saying, there's every reason to believe the Democrats are going to lose the Senate. They had uh, three times or two, uh, three times as many uh, candidates up for reelection uh, or uh, you know, seats, I should say, Democratic-held seats that were going to be um, uh, contested as opposed to Republicans, and it doesn't look like it's going to shake out that way. Yeah, Republicans were defending 10 seats, and Democrats were defending 31 or 32 seats. Uh, and what's more, most of the seats that Republicans were defending were in red areas, places like Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Wyoming, Idaho, um, Utah. So it didn't look like the kind of environment where we're going to make gains. In fact, the discussion was, can we hold the ground? Can we hold the Senate? Uh, and particularly since this is a 2000, class of 2006, if you recall in 2006, we won uh, the majority that year by winning a lot of states by 10,000 votes, 20,000 votes. I mean, Virginia and Montana and Missouri, these were all insanely tight states. So we had to hold these states. And again, in states like Virginia, Montana, Missouri, that actually have uh, been tougher for Democrats in recent years. So things look really bleak. And then an amazing thing happened is, is that Republicans nominated a bunch of crazies. They got rid of uh, an incredibly popular incumbent in Indiana, in, in Dick Luger, in favor of a crazy uh, teabagger type. Mm -hmm. uh, you had uh, up in Maine, we had a retirement, a safe Republican seat suddenly became in play. And we have in the aggregate now a situation where of the 10 closest races, uh, exactly half of them, five of them, are actually Republicans. We may actually pick up, uh, we're competitive in Arizona, Indiana, Maine, Massachusetts, that's Elizabeth Warren territory, and Nevada. Um, that was completely, almost impossible before the election began. On the flip side, a bunch of Democratic seats in tough states like West Virginia and Florida and uh, Ohio. Um, which were looking really difficult, suddenly are actually fairly safe and, and, and locked down. And, and despite, Ohio's a perfect case, the super PACs, the conservative billionaires, have spent over $30 million being up on, on, uh, on uh, Sherrod Brown, the Democrat. He's a freshman. He's actually a liberal firebrand in a state that's clearly not a liberal state. It's a, it's a middle-of-the-road battleground state. 
if anybody was in danger of super PACs in the United money, it would have been Sherrod Brown. Instead, we're seeing him actually very resilient and headed towards an easier re-election. So we have a, a situation where we're probably going to lose a seat in Nebraska. We're probably going to lose, uh, uh, likely to lose seats in, in uh, North Dakota and uh, maybe Montana. That would be Tester, right? Yeah, John Tester in Montana. Um, although he, he pulled it up in 2006. And so you have these seats that were plausibly where we were looking at, can we maybe hold the Senate? Right now, the worst case for Democrats is that the, we have a status quo, that we actually just 53-47 at the end of the election, because we're going to pick up the seat in Maine. We're going to pick up the seat in Massachusetts. Uh, and it looks at this point, uh, and I don't want to jinx it, but it looks like we may actually pick up the seat in, in Indiana thanks to uh, Richard Mur Murdoch's um, talking about rape being a gift from God. So we've been gifted this, this horrible Republican uh, class of candidates and just a hor horrible Republican message. I mean, it's been a godsend to us. And we may actually come out of this, best case scenario, we may come out of this with uh, a plus four, uh, a 57-43 Senate. Now, a lot of things would have to, you know, go right for that to happen. I'm not... I'm not um, I'm not going to count on that. Uh, my best guess right now is that maybe we pick up one seat, that we go to 54-46, which given the map that we had and the pre-election picture, if we don't lose seats, would be an insanely incredible victory for the Democrats. What, uh, so where do you think? Uh, do you think there's a, a chance for Tammy Duckworth in, in Wisconsin? Where do you think that fourth seat would come? I mean, we have Maine, Massachusetts, uh, potentially Indiana. Um, do you think... Um, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, uh, Tammy Baldwin in uh, in Baldwin, Wisconsin, right, right. and she's looking pretty good. But that we already held that seat, so that's not a pickup. That was one of those difficult holds, um, and fingers crossed. But it's oh, right. things okay. are looking was, really her, her good. Cole. Right. So uh, where where do you think we'll pick that up? That fourth seat. Our our, our possibilities. I mean, right now Maine is a, is a pickup. Massachusetts is a pickup. That's two. Right. That'll offset. That'll be partly offset by Nebraska, which would be minus one. After that, we're actually very competitive in the remaining seats. We may actually even hold on to North Dakota. It's close enough, and the uh, Democratic candidate is good enough where we may, we may actually hold it. So that may actually be one of the the, the most likely or uh, one of the most likely maps where we lose Nebraska, we pick up Maine, we pick up Massachusetts. Now we may pick up Indiana. I'm feeling pretty good about Indiana. Uh, and I'm not feeling that great about North Dakota. Again, that leaves us as plus one. So both of those scenarios are actually quite plausible. I think Arizona is getting away from us. I'm not sure we'll pick up Arizona. Uh, and Nevada, the poll, Nevada is one of those tricky states. The last three cycles, the polling has been horribly off because they don't know how to poll uh, Latinos. And it's just uh, going into the 2010 election, uh, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid was supposed to lose by about two to three points. That's what the polling said. He won by five. Right. Right now, our candidate in Nevada, uh, Shelley Berkeley, is losing by two to three points. Does that mean that this polling disaster will repeat itself and she'll win? You know, past performance is no guarantee of future, uh, uh, what happens in the future. So I'm not going to sit there and say the polls are wrong again, but they have been wrong. So I'm cautiously optimistic about it. But right now, just looking at the data, I would have to say that we're not going to win it. But again, the data's been horribly wrong in Nevada for three cycles in a row. All right, so let's uh, let's move to uh, the House briefly. There's um, there's little chance the Democrats, if any, they're going to um, uh, pick up um, or going to take control of the House. I think at this point, and the question is, uh, will they pick up any seats at all? Um, what's your sense? I mean, we've talked about the reasons quite a bit on this program. I think the overriding one is probably the redistricting that took place in t uh, following the 2010 census. There's also, I guess, uh, part of that is also we lost some opportunities in California with their new primary system. Um, but uh, give me a sense if you think there were other reasons, uh, if the, um, the, the D triple C did a decent job and, and what you think the outlook looks like. Yeah, it, it's been one of those weird... The House has been very strange because we've seen, obviously, in the Senate, we've seen uh, the numbers moving in a Democratic direction. Uh, obviously, Obama did very well over the summer. He had his hiccup after the first debate, but he's rebounded. Uh, he's headed to what looks like a comfortable re-election victory. The House, though, when you look at the House generic polling, uh, where you ask poll, you know, people you're polling, 
are you going to vote for the Democrat or the Republican? And it's been pretty much deadlocked to a very slight Democratic advantage the entire cycle. To pick up the uh, House, we would have had to have about a 5 to 10 point lead in that generic uh, polling. We haven't had that. And I'm not quite sure I understand why or, or, or quite grasp in what the dynamics are there. But part of it is the redistricting, obviously. They shored up their most vulnerable incumbents. Um, part of it is actually, I think, Citizen United money, uh, super PAC money, doesn't have a lot of effect at the presidential level. We haven't seen it have a lot of effect at the Senate level. I actually do think it's having an effect down ballot where people aren't as well known. And obviously, congressmen aren't, and women aren't very well known. They're sort of down ballot. I think money has a factor in it. Right now, I would say maybe about a 10, 12 seat pick is what we're seeing. So we're going to make gains. Uh, there's, there's, I, I have no doubt about that. The issue is, um, are we going to get to 25? We're not going to get to 25. Right. And uh, what about uh, what about Michelle Bachman? Do you have a sense of wh- whether we're, she is going to exit uh, stage, I guess, right? Stage crazy, <laughs> crazyville? <laughs> stage way out there. Uh, it's, a dis- it's a conservative district. It's a Republican district. The fact that that race is even competitive just shows how terrible of a candidate she has become, how out of touch she has with her district. I mean, they're, they're clearly sick of her. Enough to overcome the Republican tilt of that district, tough to say, but I got to say, um, there's a ton of money pouring into that district from both sides. I mean, they all see it as Republicans definitely feel the heat. I would give the edge to to Bachman just based on on the demographics of her district, but the fact that this thing is even competitive makes me make, makes me doubt my, my, my prediction. It, it can very well... She could be knocked out. I'd love to see her knocked out. Steve King in Iowa, um, Alan West in Florida, and uh, Joe Walsh in Illinois. And Joe Walsh is a goner. Alan West, that district looks, that race looks 50-50, man. That's, that's tough. And I haven't seen any numbers out of that Iowa uh, race with Vilsack, Christine Vilsack, yeah. and, and, and Kings. Uh, so I'm not sure what's going on there. But given that the numbers in Iowa in general are trending towards Obama's direction, that actually... and. I'm, I'm hopeful there, but if we were able to knock out three of those four, I, that would be a successful night for me. Do you do you think? I mean, when I when I think of uh, what, what surprises me about uh, Congress, even knowing the sort of um, the structural difficulties that Democrats faced in in uh, in this election, you know, the redistricting and and also the, I think you're absolutely right about the um, Citizens United money. I think it makes a much bigger impact in these races. Uh, you know, you can come in. With a million dollars, you can buy all sorts of ad time in, in a lot of these districts. Uh, you can really just um, uh, just inundate people with it. But do you think that there was, it seems to me that part of the problem was that Paul Ryan was not nationalized enough. Like some of the, like like Medicare and Social Security, which seemed to me to be the most sort of bread and butter, um, most easily digestible issues for uh, people running for Congress were not exploited. Paul Ryan was just simply not exploited enough, and perhaps by President Obama, uh, for it to filter down to congressional races. Yeah, no, clearly that didn't happen. And the fact that Democrats have an advantage on Medicare, but it's not a major advantage, is part of the problem. I mean, they, they should have been able to write it. Now, the reality, though, and, uh, and this is frustrating as, as a liberal, is that one of the Democratic super PACs, Priorities, did a focus group, and he basically told the attendees what the Ryan plan was. Right. And then they said, uh, they said uh, Mitt Romney, uh, you know, he supports all of this. And the focus group recipients thought it was so ludicrous that they refused to believe it. They treated it as just, oh, it's just political nonsense lies because it was so crazy to them that they just did not believe it was true. And I suspect this is what's happening in all these districts where you, Democrats talk about Democrats want to want to eliminate Medicare. And people think that's just such a crazy thing that nobody would actually want to get rid of Medicare that they refuse to believe it. And, uh, and then the Republicans have done a decent job of muddying the waters with the 8,000 times where they claim Democrats cut Medicare by $700 billion, blah, 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 right? So they have, uh, they muddied the water and Democrats sort of seem to back off. And, and I think, I don't know if they saw in their, in their polling or their focus groups that people just weren't buying it. 
and they, they didn't press her advantage, but clearly they didn't do the job in communicating that to, to, um, to voters. And if there's one big failure in, in the Democratic strategy this year, that is exactly it. And I think you've pinpointed it. I, I, would, I would add that you know we had like a week after Paul Ryan was picked, Joe Biden got out there, was in a, was in a couple, he did this twice in one day. He was in a couple of cafes. I think it was in Ohio. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe it was Pennsylvania. And he uh, basically said, I guarantee you our administration will not make any cuts whatsoever to Social Security. I flat out guarantee you, he said. And since that day, those words have not been repeated. We've heard... Uh, we will not privatize it. We've heard we have no difference between it. I think that was a massive failure. And it, it's also a scary failure going forward because I think the only reason why you don't exploit that in the campaign is if you have a weird integrity uh, to the idea that you're going, that you need to create some space to actually go ahead and make some, you know, tweaks uh, to, you know, cut 5 or 10, 15, 20% of. A, a, an old person's pension uh, down the road, uh, it seems to me, which is which I think there's a real electoral price that is going to be paid at the very least on the House level, I think, because of it. And I think um, uh, it's uh, it, it should be it, it should set off alarm bells for everybody. But um, beyond that, tomorrow, you are I don't know. You know, I know people. There are people who who are are more into the numbers and to the uh, to the elections than uh, someone like you, but uh, most of them got their start at your site anyways. Uh, so who will you be following tomorrow? Of course, we've got a uh, live blogs at Daily Co's, but what Twitter feeds, what uh, sites will you be following uh, tomorrow? In other words, pro tips time. <laughs> Greg Rowe. Uh, uh... Uh, Greg, Daniel, Greg I was, Rowe. Um, I mean, these are Twitter handles. Uh, Joe Ralston in Nevada. There's a couple of local journalists in some of these key states that can actually really give some context to the numbers. But I gotta say, the elections team and and uh, the elections team at Daily Coast is sort of a all star of a bunch of people around the web that were really good at elections data crunching. So Daily Coast elections. Um, we're going to have an absolute fantastic number of people. They've got their spreadsheets fired up, literally, their spreadsheets, where they're going to be pumping in numbers and then doing projections based on those numbers on where each state should fall. So we're going we're, we're to have quite the, quite the uh, group of people uh, at the LA Coast. But, but um, obviously, I, I, I'm also following about 500 people on, on Twitter. And, and uh, i got to say, the, the, that stream, it's going to be running fast and furious, but there's some good data that comes out of that. So I'll be retweeting a lot of the best stuff, too. Greg Rowe, Joe Ralston, is that what you said? Yeah. Uh, D. Taniel. D. Taniel. Uh, what's his Taniel Twitter? Now, people don't realize this, but... Um, uh, it's just Taniel. T-A-N-I-E-L. And, well, oh, great. We got that one. People don't realize that... Um, uh, that... Uh, that Nate Silver got his start at uh, Daily Coast as uh, Poblano doing the same type of number crunching. It's Daily Coast is a haven for numbers and stats geeks. I mean, that's why we call ourselves the, the reality-based community because we're not going on gut feeling here. I mean, this is based on the data. My certainty, just like Nate Silver's certainty, is based on numbers. Now, there's always the off chance that every poll is wrong and conservatives are right that every poll is wrong. Not really likely because I trust the data. And it's, 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 I've gotten in trouble in my ele election prognostications when I've stopped trusting the data and I've tried to rationalize why it's not looking as good for Democrats. They're doing exactly everything that I've done wrong in the past where I've screwed up and they're going to be, they're going to have egg in their face uh, after uh, tomorrow. How crazy do you think the right wing is going to become on Thursday? I mean, assuming, assuming that we have results uh, by Tuesday. Into Wednesday, they're in shock. I guess you know, like the, you have like a twenty-four hour period where I think like you're just in total shock. But how crazy do you think they're going to become on Thursday? Because this is, I mean, this is. I, I remember how crushing uh, two thousand four was. Uh, we all anticipated that Kerry was going to win. There were exit polls. We were convinced of it. 
Uh, maybe this is what you're pointing to in terms of data, because now when I go back and I look at those polls, I go, hmm, it really, I it guess didn't it, look that good. <laughs> it, was only, it was only three polls that I must have ignored every other poll. Um, exactly. <laughs> but, but, uh, that's where I got in trouble. Uh, they're already kind of crazy. Uh, I don't know if you saw because that. Like, I mean, apparently the something like 80% of, of Romney voters are convinced he's going to win. Yeah, no, they're in trouble. And, uh, and that's certain, I mean, it's a difference between us in 2004 and us in 2010. I mean, we knew we were going to lose in 2010. We didn't try to rationalize it away or, or create an alternate reality. And yeah, 2010 sucked, but I didn't wake up the next day crushed. You know, I knew it was coming. We were prepared. So they're not prepared for what's coming up, which is going to make it more. I'm going to enjoy it more. I got to say, <laughs> I'm going to get some sadistic pleasure out of that, but they're already making excuses and it, and already Talk right, it's a hurricane. It's um, yeah, they, it's they, a hurricane. I mean, Eric Erickson. I don't know if you saw this at Red State, but he's a CNN guy too. He's on CNN. He said it didn't matter who won because the uh, the rapture's coming. I saw <laughs> that fifty thousand feet. I've got a I, here. It is fifty thousand feet <laughs> looking down. Um, yep, the rapture's coming. So who cares? Uh, and uh, you have people like uh, like um, Dick Morris, who who was so certain because he had the the secret poll that was the one true poll of all polls that had Romney winning in a landslide. Now he's hedging. And of course he's blaming, he's blaming uh, uh, Sandy, just like a lot of these other people are, but they're starting to hedge because they've gone out on this limb and they're not, they're, they're going to get sawed off. I mean, it's, they're nuts. I mean, even if by some miracle Romney were to pull this off, it wouldn't be a landslide. There's just no way in hell it's going to happen. So uh, they have to start walking back, but the crazies online, I mean, there's one thing about the ones who are on CNN, and, on, and I guess I'd say it because the Fox ones are same one as online. Um, they are absolutely 100% convinced. So I'm, I'm looking forward to the Civil War. I'm looking forward to the, uh, to the Romney um, was too, too uh, liberal, yeah. even though nobody's going to sort of pay attention that Romney gained in the polls when he moved to the left. I mean, he was getting killed. When he was a severe conservative. It's, oh, right. It, it, the first debate was all about Mitt Romney finally making that turn to the center. He actually got to the left on uh, President Obama on a couple of things. Um, and there's no doubt in my mind that they're going to move further to the right. Let me ask you this quickly. Joe Biden, again, the other day, repeated what President Obama said, uh, had said multiple times. He said it before the 2010 election. He said it again. And that is, when the Republicans win, they're going to realize that now they have to deal. Do you think that's the case? I mean, I'm very, I'm very uptight about the uh, the, the the grand bargain, and that, um, and I'm not going to talk too much about it now because uh, we'll have plenty of time to talk about it in the next two days. That, that's uh, our civil war. <laughs> and exactly, and and um, well, why do you think Joe Biden says that? Is it just because they they think to the extent that there are any undecided voters out there, they want to hear this notion of we can get along after the election? Yeah, people like that bipartisan crap. The undecided voters, people who don't pay attention to this shit, so they don't know that there aren't two sides that are completely 100% uh, opposed and one side is batshit insane. They don't know this. So, um, and, and I realized this. I mean, this is this is amazing. Was Did you watch the debates with the CNN dial focus group? Yeah. All right. Every time... Either Biden or Obama attacked, or even Romney for that matter. Yep. The numbers went down. And these were undecided voters, right? Idiots, essentially. And they just want everybody to get along because they couldn't be bothered to pay attention to what's happening. And, and for whatever reason, some of it is legitimate. People are having difficult lives. Well, I mean, it's decide. easy. Whenever there's conflict, it means that they actually have to engage more. And they are definitionally people who don't want to engage in politics. So you have a situation where the 2 3%, 5% that are undecided at this point, that's the crowd. They don't want to hear attacks. They want to hear about how we're all going to get along and sing Kumbaya and be wonderful, and, which is why Romney's been talking about how bipartisan he is, even though his record of that is zero. Uh, and that's why Obama and Biden are, because the few that are left are that crowd. They don't want to hear conflict, so you can't give them anything. And at this point, if you don't have your bases with you, you know, you're SOL, so you better have your bases with you, you know, so the red meat has to go out and all the BS about bipartisanship. Obama won big on this. And part of the problem that I saw in the last four years is that he actually believed it. And I'm hoping that the new <laughs> second term Obama is going to be less, uh, less um, 
naive about Republicans wanting to work with him. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I think I, I hope that naivete is gone. I also hope some of his um, his political leanings have also gone away. But I don't, I'm not so convinced about that. But we shall see. We will. Uh, we, we will. I, I suspect uh, you're right uh, that there will be a bit of. Uh, at the very least, a, a civil tussle in the context of those of us on the left with this whole grand bargain thing. But um, that's uh, that w- we've got plenty of time to to save our uh, keep our powder dry for that. Uh, tomorrow will be <laughs> the big day. Um, but uh, Marcos, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks so much, Marcos Melitzas, folks. Check out the Daily Kos. Uh, you will find there. All sorts of, um, it really is, they, they're they just, they're obsessive. Uh, the, they've got guys there with spreadsheets and whatnot, and, um, you know, who else are you going to go to? Unskewedpolls? Unskewedpolls.com? <laughs>